Father, we thank you once more for your great love, your mercy towards us, and your patience. Bless us now as we open our minds and our hearts. May we realize that the way we do things on this earth is not your way at all. Help us to see that this is not our home. Bless us now as we hear what you have for us today. Amen. We're still working on the temptations, but we're moving around a little bit to see what Ellen White has to say in different places. We want to be sure we understand we're listening to a heavenly message. We're not listening to Ellen White. She received her message through the angels. But the angels received it directly from Jesus. So this message comes to us from Jesus. We need to understand that. I'm going to read part two of her four-part series on tempted in all points like as we are. And so I'm going to start right in because I want to get to another article if we can. All right. Reading, Christ paid an infinite price to redeem the world. Now, does that say anything to us? Does it tell us a vital truth? What does it mean he paid an infinite price? Well, it means it wasn't a human that died for us alone. That's what it means. Because no human is infinite, not even Jesus the human. Only a God is infinite. So it was God that died for us. And of course, that's blasphemy to the Christian world. They say, well, God can't die. Well, it's true. God as a God cannot die. But Jesus didn't die as a God. He died as a man. But that man happened to be a God. <laughs> so when you have the both of them together, you can't separate them. It will never happen in all eternity. You, no one will ever see Jesus divine and Jesus the son of man separated it's impossible it's who he is okay so it says he sacrificed he sacrificed does that mean on the cross no it says it was an influence he sacrificed his honor in heaven he left heaven and no trinitarian believes that because trinity teaches that the three cannot be separated. Okay? That would mean that if Jesus left heaven, he had to bring the Father and the, the so-called Holy Spirit with him. So she's telling us some very real things here. All right. He sacrificed his honor, his riches, his glorious home, and the royal courts, and endured the fierce assaults of Satan. Assaults. That's very important. There are people trying to say that Jesus is just like us. Well, if he was just like us, he wouldn't need assaults from Satan. He would have had a problem within himself. But Jesus did not have that problem. A.T. Jones and some others, they invented that. And, and that's been spread around. But this sentence says, the assaults of Satan. That's where the problem comes from. It's from Satan. That man might have, now listen carefully, he came that man might have strength to overcome as he overcame. So what did Jesus come for? Did he come so that we could believe he died on a cross and now we can go to heaven? It doesn't say that at all. That's Sunday keeping. Jesus did not come here so we could believe he died and now we can go to heaven. He came to give us strength. To do what? To live like he lived. You mean I'm supposed to live like Jesus did? Well, that's exactly what it says. <laughs> now, I want to remind you, this, this message is from heaven. No person made this up. This is what God says. This is what Jesus told the angels to teach Alan White so we can understand. Okay, I'm reading from Youth Instructor, December 28th. 1899, a year after she wrote Desire of Ages. 
or the, well, after it was published, excuse me, it took about 10 years to write the book. <laughs> All right, so it says, the temptations that Satan brings to bear upon the human race. How many is that? Is anybody left out? There are no innocent babies. That sentence says it. The human race. It says here, those, those temptations are severe. But his test, his temptation, the word is test. She knew what the word perezo in the Greek means. It means test. The test for the Son of God. Why does she have to keep saying that, Son of God? Because it's true. <laughs> Why? Why else would she say it? <laughs> All right. But the test for the Son of God was a hundredfold more severe. A hundredfold? Woo. Is that a one with, with 99 zeros after it? <laughs> How much is that? <laughs> Who can count like that? <laughs> with a hundred zeros. <laughs> it was not merely, merely, not merely, uh, you get a word? It was not merely the nine pangs of hunger that made his sufferings so intense. It was the guilt of the sins of the world. And when she says world, she's not talking about the planet. The planet can't sin. <laughs> When she says world, she means humans, okay? You remember that when she says the word world. So, as she says, it was the guilt of the sins of the world which pressed so heavily upon him. He who knew no sin. Do we believe that? Jesus knew nothing about sin in his life. He was pure. He was holy. How could people say he was just like us? How in the world? I've never seen a, an absolutely pure, holy, natural human being. I've never seen one. Jesus is one. <laughs> he was the only one. <laughs> we want to get to that word only someday. Because it's really getting to me that there are people saying there's only one God. The Bible doesn't teach that. There is not only one God. So let's get all going in here. He knew no sin. He was made sin for us. That means it, our sin was put on him. He didn't become a sinner. He did not become sin, but he took our sin. With his terrible weight of guilt upon him, he withstood the fearful test. What was the test? The same thing we are going to be tested on. Because we are to overcome exactly the same way as he overcame. That's why we're looking at this. Okay? The test upon, number one, appetite. Number two, upon the love of the world and honor and upon pride of display. And maybe we should just say two words about that. We, we have an idea what pride is, but what is pride of display? I want to stand out in front of people. See? I want to be a leader. <laughs> I want to be a big shot. I want to be rich. I want to, because I love the world. And because I love the world, I have to be a big shot in this world. Okay? So those are the three things Jesus overcame. It says, Christ endured these great temptations, overcoming in our behalf and working out for us a righteous character. Now, that doesn't mean he just hands them out characters. <laughs> we have to earn our own character. That Sunday keeping that says, oh, he just gives me everything. He does everything. No, Jesus doesn't do everything. He does the important things. Merit. Yes. He's the only one who has merit. He's the only one who earned the right to save somebody else. We can't do that. So let's pay attention here. We don't want to be Sunday keepers anymore because we were all fooled into being Sunday keepers when we joined the church. Yeah, we kept Saturday instead of Sunday, but the rest of Sunday keeping we still had. Yes, I hate to tell you that, but they turned you into a Sunday keeper. Only now you feel better than them because you go to church on Saturday. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> 
That is not the way it goes. So, paragraph two. Did you know we just only did one paragraph? <laughs> <laughs> oh, a little light is so full. If we really wanted to study this carefully, it would take us a month to see what this paragraph really says. Mm -hmm. Yes. But we, could, we don't have a month. Paragraph two. Many who fall under temptation, many, that's a good word, many, many who fall under temptation excuse themselves with the plea that Christ divinity helped him to overcome. All of a sudden, he's not like them. Do you get that, the contradiction? That's their excuse. Oh, oh, he wasn't like me. He had divinity and that helped him out. He was God. Of course he didn't sin. But that's stupid because he didn't come here to show what a God can do. He came to show what a man can do. He became a man. He did not operate as a God here. This is her next sentence. This is a mistake. I like the other word better. This is an error. <laughs> this has nothing to do with truth. This is a mistake. Christ has brought divine power within the reach of all. So yes, you can say Jesus had divine power, but he didn't use his divine power. He he had the, his father's divine power, and we have the same thing. We have the divine power of Jesus. But it's the same process, exactly. A human with divine power. Now, we see what it did for Jesus. Do you suppose it'll do the same thing for us? You think about that for a moment. <laughs> you think about it. You hold on to it. Because unless you get a hold of this, you're never going to understand Christianity. Never. We were sold a bill of goods when we were baptized into a church that didn't know any of this. The Son of God came to the earth because he saw the moral power in man is weak. He came to bring finite man in close connection with God. He didn't come here to make us believe in God. That's not why he came. He didn't come here to give us faith in God, although we must have faith, but that's not why he came. He came to put us in connection. Do you see the difference? When you're connected with somebody, <laughs> yeah, that's for real. When we're connected, that means soul is joined to soul. Yes, when you become a Christian, your soul is joined to the soul of Christ. Is there power in that? Well, didn't he say, I'm the, I'm the vine over there, and you're the branches. Have you ever seen a living branch over here and the vine over there? <laughs> you see how stupid that is? There's only one way you can be a living branch branch. You've got to be part of the vine. And so when the vine gets food, you get the same food. So whatever happens in that vine happens in you. We know all these things. But the devil comes along and says, oh, that's a metaphor. Yes, it's the devil saying that. He says, that's not literal. You can't, you can't me really think you're part of Jesus. You can't really think that, can you? Well, if I'm not part of Jesus and he's not part of me, I'm lost. Because there's only one salvation. Only one. Christ was placed in the same position toward the Father as is the sinner. Well, that's me. You mean Jesus came 
to be in exactly the same place that I'm in? Yes, except he was not a sinner. But he took the position that I'm in to show me how to overcome it. So he knows all about it. He's come to sit where I sit, to walk where I walk, to talk to the people I talk to, to have the same fake news hitting me. Yes. And you know what the fake news is? Jesus did everything. That's the fake news. He didn't do everything. He did the parts I can't do. But the parts I can't do, I can do. Guess who has to do them? <laughs> and if I don't do them, for me, who's going to do them? It's not going to happen. So there are no excuses. Don't think, I've got my ticket to heaven. Jesus died for me. I believe in the cross. I go to church. I even pay tithe. I'm sorry, folks. None of that means anything. Though I speak with the eloquence of inspired men and holy angels, if I have not the love of Jesus in me, it's like blowing brass or beating on brass. And, yeah, you know, it says that even though I have my body to be burned and sacrifice my body, if I don't have that love in me, it's no good. See, have you been reading 1 Corinthians 13? Oh, there's a lot in there. All right, let's keep looking at this. Christ had the privilege of depending on the Father for strength. And so have we. Have we been reading the Spirit of Prophecy? Have we been understanding the Spirit of Prophecy? I'm going to start pulling out the hard ones. We have just started. We've been together for over 12 years and I have never gotten to them until about now. <laughs> Because there's so much you have to understand about Christianity before you hit the real thing. Because you know why? We were ruined. We were told righteousness by faith is the gospel. And there's not a word of it in the Bible. I'm sorry, but that'll wipe out everybody in the churches. Righteousness by faith is not in the Bible the way it's taught today. What's in the Bible is righteousness. That's in the Bible. And what is righteousness? It's doing what's right. What you believe means nothing. It's doing it. And of course, there's only way, one way you can get there. You have to have faith in Jesus. But you don't have faith in a, an abstraction. You have faith in somebody you're connected with. Without a connection, nothing is happening. All right. So it says, uh, because he laid hold of the hand of infinite power and he held it fast, he overcame. So how do you overcome? Take a hold of the infinite hand. <laughs> We're trying to do it ourselves, and we know it doesn't work. We are taught to do the same. He met every temptation. Have you got this? Every temptation with, it is written. Why are those three words important? Who wrote them? Well, don't say a prophet. Yeah, they used the pen. But who wrote them? Who's the author of the it is written? It is not a third God. That's not in the Bible. There is no third God to write it. It's Jesus. Jesus is the author of the Bible. So does he know what's in the Bible? <laughs> well, he knew what was in the Bible. He said it is written. How many of those did he use when he was talking to the devil? Did he did he get a Bible study together and say, well, here's 30 scriptures? What, what did he do? <laughs> he went to the place. <laughs> he put his finger right on, boom, right there. And the devil had to shut his mouth because he hit it exactly. And he knew, man, that's the right answer. <laughs> I got nothing more to say here. <laughs> can we do that? Yes, you can. But you know what you have to do first? Yes. 
You have to know what's in the Bible. And you're not going to get it looking at the web. I'm sorry. You're not going to get it. You're wasting your time if you think you're going to get religion from the web. And you're doing worse than wasting your time. I'm not going to get into that. I can't tell you how strongly I understand the web is from the devil. You know why people go to the web? Maybe you can figure it out. I won't tell you. It is written. He met every temptation with it is written. And so must we. There you got it. Three more words. So must we. That means you're going to have to start spending some time with the Bible. Oh, but I don't have time. I'm so busy. I'm running around doing this. I'm amusing myself with this. I'm going over there to have fun. I'm, oh, I just don't have time. I want to hear anyone say that when they're standing in front of Jesus, when this is all over, and he looks at us and doesn't say a word. You know, he's not going to speak to us. He's just going to look at us. What a look it's going to be. It's going to be a look of love and disappointment for many people. And he's just going to look at them. And their mind is going to tell them, oh, 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 look what I did over there. I ignored him here. Oh, I rejected him over here. Oh, look what I did over there. I knew better. Oh, he doesn't have to say anything. We know. Do you know what? We know today we don't have to wait until then. We know right now what we're doing. And don't say, well, I have faith. Oh, I have righteousness by faith. Oh, I'm a church member. Oh, I believe. What do you believe? I can tell you what you believe. Just look at what you're doing. That's what you believe. <laughs> simple, isn't it? It's just so simple. Okay, it is written. Here's what a person who, who has it is written. Here's what they can say. The Lord God will help me. Therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore have I set my face like a flint. And I know that I shall not be ashamed. He is near that justifies me. Who will contend with me? Behold, the Lord God will help me. Who is the Lord God? It's Jesus. You see, the Sunday keepers always say that's the Father, but how can they say it's a Father when they believe in the Trinity? If it's anybody, it's got to be the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, according to them. Well, that doesn't exist. God in the Bible, our God, is Jesus. Okay? Who will contend with me? Who is he that shall condemn me? You know, that's all in Isaiah. She doesn't say that. Ellen White does not tell you the scriptures. She just figures you know them because you read your Bibles. <laughs> Do you know that all the pioneers knew exactly where she was quoting from? They could stand up and all of them tell you, oh, that's Isaiah. Yeah. And you will find the other pioneer speakers did the same thing. They would just quote scripture and never say where they got it from. And the people knew exactly where he was reading. That church has died. Do you know it? We claim to be Seventh-day Adventists. We are not Seventh-day Adventists. We're Sunday keepers going to church on Saturday. The language of Christ on many occasions shows that he was placed in the same position that we are. He had to walk by faith. You mean like me? Yes, he had to do that. As we walk by faith, and when temptations came to him with overwhelming power, he used the language that every child on earth must use. The Son of Man can do nothing of himself. Can you say that conscientiously? I can do nothing spiritual in myself, by myself, of myself. It's not there for me to do by myself. That's what Jesus said. He couldn't do anything without his father. I think we ought to start understanding this. That he was showing us exactly how to live as a human on this earth with all the things we call problems. <laughs> Jesus declared, now this is important. See if you understand what he's saying. He said, what he seeth, the father do. 
whatsoever things he said. These also do it the Son. What's he saying? He only does what he sees the Father do. Let's see what else he said. I can of my own, my own self do nothing. As I hear. What does that mean, as I hear? The only thing he can do that's right on this earth is what he hears God say to him. And after he hears, he says, I judge. The word judge is not the good word here. It's what the Greek word means, but if you're spiritual, you see it means more than that. The word really means, in almost every context, discern. He said, when I hear, I discern. I know what it's saying. There's no question in my mind. I know who's talking to me. So when I hear from God, I judge, I discern. I know what's being said. Something is being revealed to me. See? It says that in 1 Corinthians. You remember it talks about the mind of God and only God knows his own mind? And it says that a person who doesn't have the mind of God cannot discern, cannot judge what's in you as a Christian because you have the mind of God. So how can a heathen teach a Christian? You see? It's impossible. Only a Christian can know the mind of another Christian because they have the mind of God. So let's go on here. I want you to see the important part of what he just said. He said, as my father has taught me, I speak those things. Wait a minute. Jesus only said the things he was told to say? Didn't he have a brain? Didn't he have a mind? What is this? He only says what he's told. <laughs> but that's what he said. He, he's telling us how to live as a human. If you only do what God reveals to you and he tells you what to say, you're safe. You can never go wrong. You will never be tempted beyond your power because you will only do what God has revealed to you to do and to say. And Jesus says that's the way he lives as a human. He's telling, telling us, I only say what God tells me. You know, a lot of people talk too much. Everybody talks too much. If we would talk less and pray more, Ellen White says, maybe we'd get some of this. <laughs> So Christ has wrestled with the powers of darkness. He has trodden the road over which every son and daughter of Adam must pass. Every, does that mean there's some innocent ones that won't have to do that? There are people out there teaching right now on the web that babies are born innocent. And they come up with all these scriptures. But every one of them is distorted. Yes. And these people are honest and sincere. And they're trying to teach the truth. But when they say a, born, a baby's born innocent, they don't know what they're talking about. I'm sorry. And there are some people who write to me and say, what is this big war about? Some people teach this, some people teach that. What's going on? The answer is quite simple. We're not all listening to the same voice. That's a crime. We could all be wrong. Yes, that's possible. But we can't all be right. That is also impossible. We better figure out what, the God, what God is telling us. So Jesus says he only speaks the things he's told. Now, when he said he was going to send the Comforter, did he say he will not speak of himself? He will not speak from himself? What, what does he say? He will speak what he's told. Do you get it? If there is a third God, how is it possible that he's equal with the other two that are God, but he can only say what he's told? Isn't that dumb? 
<laughs> the assembly came in. And the Adventists have swallowed it. Yeah. No, Jesus is telling us how it works. God tells the subordinate what to say. And the subordinate only says those things. So, the spirit that comes to us is the angels. And the angels are instructed by Jesus what to tell us. They teach us. They protect us. They guide us. They're our direct link with heaven. Where's Jesus? He's in heaven. That's what the Bible says. He's with his Father, who is also in heaven. So how can Jesus be in heaven and be here at the same time? Well, people say, oh, that's omnipresence. They don't know what they're talking about. Omnipresence is Jesus sending his spirit in the angels. And in Revelation, it says he has seven spirits. Is that all he has? No, he has millions and billions of them. There's an angel for every single human on the earth today. Billions of people. So his spirit is everywhere through those angels. And it also says in the same scripture, he has seven eyes. Those same spirits who are everywhere on his behalf on this earth can see what they see and whatever they see, he sees. So he can see everywhere through them. Do you see it? This is all so simple if we stop being theologians. <laughs> if we stop listening to ministers that don't know what they're saying. But we will never know that if we don't read the Bible for ourselves. We will never, never understand what they're saying wrong until we see what the Bible says. And the Spirit of Prophecy. The Spirit of Prophecy says the same thing as the Bible. So, the trust in God he contrasts with trust in self. Behold all ye that kindle a fire, he says. Are you aware of something called sparks of fire? You've read it. Do you know what you read? Please don't skip scriptures that you don't understand. Mm -hmm. Dig in. Find out what's going on here. Get a dictionary. Go read the Spirit of Prophecy. Do something. So here's what Jesus says in the Bible. Ye that compass yourselves about with sparks... You walk in the light of your fire and in the sparks that you have kindled. This shall you have of mine hand. You shall lie down in sorrow. Ooh, that's not a good thing. It says you walk around in a fire that, that you have sparked yourself. It's your own sparks. What is that? What are my sparks? They're what I want to do. It's, it's my ambitions. It's my desires. It's, it's what I set myself. That's what I want to do. He says, those are your own sparks. They're not coming from me. You're not waiting to have me reveal things to you, to speak through you. You're doing your own thing. Who do you think you are, Frank Sinatra? No, we're not Frank Sinatra, but we try to be like him. I did it my way, big deal. <laughs> it's a shame that he's going to be disappointed terribly someday unless in the last few seconds of his life he found something Christ is the captain of our salvation he became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings the suffering they poured in upon the son of God oh I missed one Son of God is beyond anything that man will be called to endure. Yet Christ overcame and perfected a spotless character. Now listen carefully. By his suffering and resistance, he made plain. <laughs> he made plain to man that perfection of character can be obtained and maintained by humanity. He showed us how it's done. He suffered. He resisted. He perfected the character. He said, this is all you have to do, what I just did. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> you don't have to do anything more. Just do what I did. It was so 
help us, your God. Oh, come on. Uh, are you, aren't you going to get this? <laughs> I did it. As a man, I put myself in your place to show you how to do it. Now hold on to your seat. Because every now and then I, I read something that I know we've never seen before. Yes, that's tough for an Adventist because we hear lots of words. When Satan fails to lead men into sin, you mean that happens? Yes, it happens. And he knows who they are. <laughs> when he fails to get them deceived and they believe churches instead of God, when he fails to get there with the first two temptations, he doesn't miss many people with the first two. He said, but when he fails with the first two, he besets them with the third. The love of the world. And in almost every case, he leads them into apostasy. Leave the truth by this means. Well, what is this love of the world? It's I gotta have everything my neighbors have. Yeah, that's it. I gotta look like them. I gotta talk like them. I gotta buy the same thing. I have to go to the same stores they go to. I gotta buy the same things online. I gotta, hey, I could go for weeks talking about what. Loving the world is. We don't have weeks. It's living like the world. Who can tell the difference between a Seventh-day Adventist and the world today? Who can tell the difference? Can you look at them? Can you go to their homes and see, oh, this is a different kind of place. Different kind of people live here. <laughs> the promise of the Comforter has been given to us. He that believeth on me, said Jesus, the works that I do, he will do. See what he just said? The person who really believes in me will live the way I live. That's just the way it is. He will do the same works, but then he added something. And greater works. Did he say that? Greater works? Will he do than I have done? Greater works in Christ? Not in magnitude, not in quality. But we have the opportunity to talk to more people than Jesus did. He only walked around and ended the play. We've got iPhones, we've got, yeah, Samsungs, we've got, who can we communicate with? Hey, I can get, get on that right now this minute and talk to somebody in Australia. Just like that, in real time, we're having a conversation, see? So what's the hang up? We can talk to anybody we want to that we have a number for. I'm not going to pursue that. He says, you will do greater works than I do because I'm going to my Father. Well, if Jesus is everywhere like all the false teachers teach, then why is he going to leave? How could he leave if he's everywhere? How is that possible to be everywhere and go from here to there? <laughs> That is mathematically impossible. It's physically impossible. If you're everywhere, you're everywhere. <laughs> but he says, you're going to do greater works because I'm not going to be here anymore. I'm going to go to the Father. Well, where's the Father? Is he everywhere? If he was everywhere, Jesus wouldn't have to move. <laughs> but he says, I'm going to go to where the Father. Where's the Father? He's in heaven. You can ask any child that, that knows nothing. Where's God? In heaven. <laughs> but, but we theologians, we can't do that. We have to say something stupid. Well, God is everywhere, but he goes to heaven. <laughs> the 
the power that came to Christ as a representative of the human race will come to every member of the human family who will make God his strength. Does that include me? I think I'm part of the human race, yes. <laughs> I'm part of that every. So what I just read here means I wasn't left out. And if I wasn't left out, I have absolutely no excuse to miss it, to not get it. I am every member of the human family. We have a great high priest which has passed into the heavens. By the way, I'm only reading the second one. There's two more after this of the arti these articles. <laughs> yeah. We have such a great high priest which has passed into the heavens. How many times has she had to say it? He went from here to the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God. How many times does she have to say that? He's the Son of God. We have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but he was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. That's for the people who say he was just like us, okay? You can't read the Bible and say all these dumb things. He was just like us. The babies are innocent, and I've got a list of them that people say that are not in the Bible. And they're not in the spirit of prophecy. Now, somebody might say, oh, have charity. Well, I'm sorry, I can't have charity when people are being taught error. Because error is always dangerous. Error never sanctifies. And if you believe in righteousness, you will be giving up error as soon as you find it. That's right. Let us, therefore, come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We may take courage and believe. Do you want the rest of the sentence? Believe that we shall overcome every imperfection of character. That's how we believe. When you leave here today, remind yourself when you get into the car, I believe. <laughs> and when you get home, say it again. Well, you know, I still believe that lasted a good hour. Oh, maybe I'm going to believe an hour from now. <laughs> yeah, we just don't believe in meetings. <laughs> say it every place you go. I believe. <laughs> well, that's enough for that one. That's a short, short article. But we got some juice out of it. So let's go to the next one before we're done here. We don't have time to do a lot. Okay. This one is called Words to the Young. So this one you can relax because she's just talking to the young people. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> she's talking to the people who don't know anything. So we're okay. She begins by saying, A mere profession of godliness is worthless. <laughs> worthless. So you can say you believe in righteousness by faith all you want. It's worthless. It is he that abides in Christ. Now, she did not say, and this is what you were all taught, that that means you believe in Christ. That's not what it means. To abide in Christ. Christ means you're in Him. How are you in Him? You're not there physically. You're here and He's over there. You're in His thoughts. You're in His mind. You're in His heart. And as long as I'm there, <laughs> do you see? That hasn't got anything to do with what you have faith in. That's a connection. You are in Christ. And where is Christ? In heaven. Doesn't the Bible say in heavenly places? We are in Christ in heavenly places? Yes, that's what it says. In every clime. 
in every nation, our youth should cooperate with God. The only way a person can be pure is to become like-minded with God. We're supposed to think like God. And she says it's the only way you can do this. How can we know God? Oh, now she's asking the question. How can we know God? Well, I want to know. What is it? She says, by studying His Word. And this is where she lands in the whole Bible. And this is life eternal, that they might know Thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom Thou hast sent. And I haven't found a person yet that understands that scripture. I'm sorry should not say there's only one God. That's not what Jesus said, and that's not what John recorded, and it's not what Ellen White believed. Monos a Latinos, Theon. Oh, you don't know what those mean. You shouldn't, you shouldn't need to know what they mean. We don't need to know Greek to go to heaven. But those three words say by themselves what I don't know that anybody's really teaching. Monos means alone. It does not mean there's just one. Do you see the difference? There are three Navy SEALs over there, and they alone are the commandos from the Navy. Does the word alone mean there's just one of them? We know better. They alone is those three seals. So alone here in the Greek does not mean there's only one God. And the word God here is not theos, like in John 1 it says, the word is with God, hotheos, the Father. And the word was what? The word was God. And it's a different word. In the, in the Greek, the word is theon. So the word of 114 is Jesus, and that word was with his father, Hotheos, the God, and he himself, Jesus, was theon. He was God. That's what it says in every Bible. So Jesus is theon. In John 17, 3, the word for God is Theon. You mean to tell me Jesus is a true God? Well, folks, we're not hearing the whole thing yet. Yes, Jesus is a true God. Can he be a fake God? Uh, Jesus is a true God. He's Theon. That's as far as I can go today. It will take us an entire meeting to understand what, what John 17, 3 is really saying that we're missing. Jesus is our God. We know that, don't we? Everybody has to know that who's going to see him come. Because they're going to say, Lo, this is our God. He will save us. Jesus is my God. I don't know if he's everybody else's God yet. But I have no question in my mind who he is. He's my creator. He is my savior. He's my redeemer. He is my God. He is the one who's going to save me on that day when he comes back because he's the one who died on the cross. And do you know where he's going to take me when he lifts me off this earth? To be with his Father, who is his God. And Jesus told us, you can call my Father your God. See? There's a whole bunch of, to this we have not been looking at yet. All right, I want to get to, the, to the, a place we can close here for today. Washing. Make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Does it say put away your faith in evil? It doesn't say that, does it? You don't have to have faith in evil. Just do it. That's enough. 
He said, put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. We're back to Isaiah again, aren't we? Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now. Let us reason together, saith the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet. They shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured with the sword for the mouth of the Lord has spoken in it. So there's only two choices here, aren't there? It's obedience to what he has revealed to us. Oh, we can rebel and say, I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to do my thing. I'm going to throw out my own sparks. There's a whole lot in that of scripture. We better leave it alone for right now. It says uh, they need to experience genuine repentance for sin. And then she said, what have they to mourn over? Why did she say that after she used the word repentance? Because that's what repentance is. We're sorry we sinned. We mourn over our sin. And then what do we do? We stop doing it. How can you say you're sorry if you don't stop? <laughs> so she says, what are they supposed to mourn over? They should mourn over the inclination to sin. Oh, you mean that's still there? Yes, that doesn't go away. We still have that to deal with. Inclination to sin, over the danger they're in. From inward corruption, you mean that didn't leave either? No, you're still a human being. You still have flesh. You still get hungry. Yeah, you still get tired. You still have to go to sleep at night. And it's okay to do all of those things Except when you overdo it, if you sleep all night and all day, guess what's going to happen to you? <laughs> and if you eat the wrong things, guess what's going to happen to you? If you do everything not the way God said to do them, you have a problem. So she said, we have this inclination and we have this inner corruption. We have this problem with our bodies. And we have a problem of outward temptation. Wait a minute, she stopped saying inward. What does that mean? That means when you become a Christian, your nature is to do the right thing now, but you have a body that's telling you something different. So you've got a fight now between your spirit and your, your body. And she says, but, but that body cannot tempt you to sin. What you're doing is listening to an outside source. Outward temptation. You're listening to wicked angels. You're listening to devils. So we have a choice who we're going to listen to. Are we going to listen to that voice that comes from heaven and says, do this? Or are we going to listen to the devil that said, you can't do that. You do this. And this is more fun anyhow. <laughs> so what's our next sentence? They should be afraid because they have so feeble a sense of the sinfulness of sin. And there are people on the web not talking about what sin is, and they're leaving out some things. And so little idea of what constitutes sin. All right, I'm going to close with this paragraph for today. When you truly repent of sin, you will not be satisfied to acknowledge simply that you are sinful, that uh, you are sinful, and let the matter rest there. <laughs> See, we're all willing to say I'm a sinner. I think we're all ready to do that one. <laughs> How can we do otherwise? <laughs> she said, "That's not enough. That's not enough." Here we go. Do you intend? to stay sinful the rest of your life? Now there's a question. There's a question. Do you intend to remain <laughs> sinful while life shall last? Is that your plan? Do you mean to violate your conscience? Do you mean to do evil always? 
Well, if we've been listening to the devil, that's exactly what he teaches. He says, well, you can say you're keeping the commandments, but you know you're really not doing it. Yeah, you know. You really can't do it. But God doesn't expect you to do it. He knows you can't. That's what the devil teaches. He teaches it in church. Yes. You can go to church any week and you'll hear it. You can't really keep the commandments. That's the devil talking. So do you intend to believe these lies? And you say, well, I guess that's me. That's my nature. I'll be sitting clear up until Jesus comes and by magic, he's going to change me. <laughs> I heard the one of the biggest evangelists in the church say that to me personally, right there mm -hmm. face to face, that we will never stop sinning until Jesus comes back. And I looked him right in the face. I told him, I hope you overcome that. Yeah. I, oh, he got mad at me. He really got mad. The devil teaches you can't stop sinning. What does the Lord say to those who have had light and yet have failed to live in accordance with it? What does he say? Here's the quote. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him it is sin that's Jesus talking if you know and do you know Mark Twain was once asked how can you believe in a book that is so difficult to understand yeah, he was asked that by some smarty and Mark Twain looked back at him and said, it's not the parts I don't understand that bother me, it's the parts I understand. <laughs> 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 yeah, that ought to bother us, all right. <laughs> to him that knoweth and doesn't do it. That's sin. Humble yourselves, therefore, in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. There is a repentance of sin that needeth not to be repented of, and every man that hath this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. You see, the issue is righteousness. The whole plan of salvation is about righteousness. It's not about getting out of the fire and going to heaven because I believe a man died on the cross. That's not the plan of salvation. Is to become pure like he's pure. And he says when he comes, I'm not ashamed to call you brother. That's Hebrews, the second chapter. He's not ashamed to call them brethren. And H.G. E. Jones messed that all up. He says them is every child of Adam. That's not true. Jesus is going to be ashamed of a lot of people. But he's not going to be ashamed of the overcomers because they are like him. All right, let's get this. We're getting close to it now. Father, we're so thick. We've been ruined by professionals. And yet it's not over. You won't let it stay that way. You paid too much. You died for us. You mean to take what you have possessed, what you have earned, what you have bought, and you plan to take it home. Bless us as we pay attention, as we open our minds and our hearts, and when you show us something, we say only one thing, yes, Lord. May that be all we ever say to you is yes, Lord. We thank you. Amen.